So this presentation will be on self-care and burnout during COVID-19. This presentation will be different from some of the others as I'm not going to focus on specific tips, rather talk about self-care and burnout broadly. So there are many sources of stress and trauma in our lives as we think about returning to classes in the fall. We're trying to figure out how to teach under unknown circumstances, the stress of the news about COVID-19, both in our broader society and in higher education. Many of us are working from home with children. Many of us are concerned about the unpredictable behavior of traditional age college students. And we're trying to think of how we can keep ourselves and our students and our families safe during these uncertain times. And these are only some of the sources of stress during the summer of 2020. And stress and trauma do a lot of bad things to our brains. They move us from what the authors of the book Yes Brain call our upstairs brain, which is our higher order thinking and executive function, and stress forces us into our downstairs brain, which is our lower order thinking, such as fight or flight. And stress not only affects our brains, but also our body, which can further aggravate our mental state. So when I was younger, I really loved the story The Giving Tree, and I love Shel Silverstein. So in the story, the tree loves a boy and gives fruit, then gives its branches, then gives its trunk, and keeps giving and giving until it's nothing left. And in the end, it's nothing but a stump, but the stump still gives the boy, who's now an old man, a place to sit. So on the surface, this is a very romantic story about giving of oneself. However, upon deeper reflection, it's clearly not promoting a healthy relationship. And during these times of stress and wanting to give our students the best education and emotional support, we can feel like this tree that we're giving, giving, giving until we have nothing left to give. And it doesn't have to be this way. That is what we're going to talk about in this presentation. So burnout is the physical or psychological condition induced in workers by overwork or overexposure to stress in the workplace. Employees who work too hard for too long can become demotivated, depressed, and in extreme circumstances suffer nervous breakdowns or worse. In these times of heightened stress and trauma, we should be looking for ways to avoid burnout long before we reach a breaking point. So in the Chronicle of Higher Education and other news sources, I have found many self-care tips for dealing with the stress of COVID-19. And these tips include sticking to a schedule, eating well, moving our bodies, getting sleep, getting outside, connecting with people through technology, limit our exposure to negative and sensational news, focus on gratitude, and focus on what you can control. And these are all very good tips, but they're also common sense and things that we should be doing all of the time. And I want to get beyond these common self-care tips. So I would like to dig deeper than these common self-care tips by understanding why we get so worn out and some additional tips specific to teaching at this point in higher ed. So why are we so worn out? One important factor in understanding why we are so stressed out right now is the topic of emotional labor. Emotional labor refers to workers' management of their emotions according to organizational feeling and emotion display rules. When managing their emotions in interactions, workers either display emotions they do not actually feel or try to make themselves feel an unexpected emotion. Much of the work on emotional labor came from a book published in 1983 called The Managed Heart by Arlie Russell Hochschild. In this book, she studied flight attendants, where the emotional experience of flying is part of the service that they offer. But she was also concerned with any profession that had direct contact with the public, required producing an emotional state in another person, and had employers that in some way controlled the emotional activities of their employees. So this could be many professions. I have read articles that apply it to workers in customer service, librarianship, and teaching. So let's take a minute to talk about the emotional labor in teaching. Teaching involves creating an emotional environment for learning, which I have talked about in some of my other presentations and is discussed in depth in Sarah Cavanaugh's book, The Spark of Learning. 
Teaching involves classroom management, and on days where we find classroom management particularly difficult, it is easy to understand how emotionally draining this can be. Teaching can be highly frustrating, and we have to hide that frustration from our students. Much of that frustration comes from differences in attitudes towards teaching and learning, and we can't control the decisions our students make. In higher education, many of those who teach have some form of job insecurity, including those who are pre-tenure, visiting, or adjunct professors. Nearly all of us feel that we do not have the resources that we need to do our job well, which include both time and financial resources. We may feel that there are many time-consuming activities, such as informal student or colleague mentoring and reading to improve our pedagogical skills that don't count for promotion and tenure. And individually, each of us have identity issues, such as race, gender, sexuality, or health and disability conditions that may make for higher emotional labor loads. According to Hochschild, there are two ways of approaching emotional labor. In surface acting, we will continue to feel our own natural feelings, but we will wear a mask in which we portray the feelings that go along with the established feeling rules. Surface acting is more likely to lead to burnout. Deep acting is when we convince ourselves that we feel something other than what we would naturally be inclined to feel. This may include excusing students' poor behavior by saying they must have had a bad day, or it could be absorbing the profession's dedication to service so deeply that it becomes our own feelings. Deep acting can greatly reduce stress, but can lead to what Hochschild calls a dimming or numbing of inner signals, which she says affects how we perceive and interpret the world around us. Teaching in a higher education also can involve secondary trauma, and this may be heightened during the time of COVID-19. Secondary trauma is the natural behavioral and emotional consequences that accrue after witnessing, aiding, or simply being exposed to those who have experienced trauma firsthand. I know that I have talked to professors who have worked with students who have ill family members or family who are experiencing significant financial stress. And as we work with those students to help them with their schoolwork and provide emotional support, that can be wearing on us as well. And we have to be aware of that and realize that we need to be managing that stress for our own emotional and mental health. Another tiring aspect of teaching involves imposter and super teacher syndromes. I know over the years I have talked to many professors who I admire greatly at Lycoming College who constantly feel like they are not good enough, that they are imposters, and that they have to pretend to be more confident in front of a classroom than they really feel. And that can be draining. Also, most of us are influenced by the super teacher myth, which Jessamine Neuhaus talks about in both a podcast episode that I have linked to for my guide and in her book, Geeky Pedagogy. She describes the super teacher as utterly selfless, absolutely devoted, and practically perfect in every way, and says that these super teachers appear regularly in popular culture and are well and truly fixed in our collective consciousness. And she argues that we should not be trying to be super teachers, that even if they exist, when people describe them, they always describe the same type of educator. And she argues that each of us brings something to the classroom and that students having a variety of types of teachers is what's most beneficial for the students. And finally, there's the issue of vocational awe. This comes from an article written by a librarian named Fabazi Attar, and I highly recommend this article even if it is focused on libraries. It applies to teaching as well. And she argues that we approach our work as if it was a religious calling, and that any time someone questions the system, it raises accusations that the person with the questions has a lack of purity required for the truly devout. One of our most powerful arguments is that to go along with this makes us martyrs, and martyrdom has a very short career trajectory. So now it's time to talk about what we can do. So many of us don't know ourselves well enough to recognize when we are running low on emotional resources, but I believe that we can all engage in reflective practices and develop necessary self-awareness required to recognize we need to engage in self-care. When it is necessary, it should become a priority so that we can make small changes to improve our emotional well-being, hopefully avoiding needing more drastic measures if we reach the point of burnout. So this is why I spent so much time talking about emotional labor in this short video, is so that we can appreciate the things that we take for granted that are wearing us out. 
And if we appreciate and recognize them, we are more likely to be aware of when they lead us to need to take some time for self-care. So one thing that we can do ahead of time is work on creating manageable workloads. As you design your classes this summer, go back and forth between imagining the class from the student's perspective with imagining how that creates your own workload. In both Small Teaching and Small Teaching Online, which are both available as ebooks through the Snowden Library, they have a lot of advice on how to meet your students' needs without overwhelming yourself. Additionally, if you are a new professor, you may want to talk to some more experienced professors for advice on planning for a manageable workload. So some suggestions are taking into account any conferences or travel that you had and not asking students to turn something in right before you know you won't be able to deal with it. If you know that grading over the weekend is difficult for you, do not have students turn things in on Fridays. Also, you may need to compare your three classes and scatter your due dates between the three classes. Sometimes managing stress and burnout does not necessarily mean putting work away, but maybe changing the work that you do. So sometimes professional growth can help avoid burnout. I know at times when I have gotten bored or burnt out, sometimes I have found my way out of that through professional development. So as we are intellectual and as we are curious about many topics as academic, think about the things that you are curious about in your professional experience and turn to the literature and each other for answers to those questions. Some suggestions for readings that I have are Geeky Pedagogy, which I am currently in the middle of right now and thoroughly enjoying, Becoming a Critically Reflective Teacher by Stephen Brookfield, Small Teaching by James Lang, and Small Teaching Online by Flower Darby are all good places to start. All of these are available through the Snowden Library, either as print books or ebooks. And in addition to reading, you may find a good source of professional growth is through communities of inquiry. So in particular, as we learn how to teach during COVID-19, there are many professors at Lycoming College trying to rethink teaching. And that can be a lot more fun to do this as a group than as individuals. So much of the literature on self-care talks about how important social relationships are to managing stress. So this is one of the common self-care tips that I highly recommend. So oftentimes self-care tips focus on individual solutions or solutions that you control personally. And I would argue that in times such as these in particular, that we need communal solutions that revolve around empathy. And I see empathy having three parts, imagination, assessment, and motivation. We're all in the situation of teaching during COVID-19 together, but each of us have our own individual strengths and challenges. So as we try to get through this together, each of us individually should use our imagination when considering others to imagine what their world perspective looks like, what their challenges may be, what their feelings may be. But we can never truly be in the shoes of other people. And so as we talk to them and interact with them, we take the feedback that they give us as assessment of how well our imagination is meeting their reality and adjust our understanding of their world as needed. And all of this takes motivation to do. So let's stay motivated to support each other with empathy. Here's a list of some of the readings that I have mentioned in this presentation and that I have found useful in dealing with the stress of teaching, particularly at this time. And as I continue to find sources that are relevant to this topic, I will continue to link to them from the guide. Thank you very much for watching this video.